Hello, Portugal. It's nice to be with you today, even from a distance. I'm going to be talking about the topic of coming to terms with fear and anxiety, I guess, uh, as well. And uh, I want to start by just giving you some background on where this lecture comes from. Um, a couple of years ago, I wrote a paper in the journal Neuron called Rethinking the Emotional Brain. Uh, and then I wrote one in PNAS last year called Coming to Terms with Fear. And so these will be the two main sources from which I'll be drawing this, uh, this lecture on the nature of fear and anxiety. Uh, and a lot of the information will also be coming out in a new book that I've uh, just completed and that will be published um, hopefully by July. Now the most common view we have about what, uh, what goes on in the brain when we're afraid is that there's some fear stimulus in the outside world. It produces a fear response. And as a result of uh, activation of the amygdala, those two things are connected. So the fear stimulus activates the amygdala and the fear response comes out. Now, this, there are lots of different ways to interpret what that means. And the most common way is that there's a kind of feeling of fear inside the amygdala that allows the stimulus to be detected, create that feeling of fear, and then out comes the response because you feel afraid. But I think that this is, uh, uh, not the right way to think about it. But let me talk about uh, where the research that I'm going to be using to describe all this comes from. Uh, for the past 30 years or so, I've been studying something called Pavlovian fear conditioning, where a rat's in a chamber, he hears a sound, the sound is paired with an electric shock, and you only have to do that one time. And later, when the rat hears the sound, he'll freeze, um, blood pressure and heart rate will go up, uh, stress hormones will be released, all of the same things that happens in a human brain uh, when a, uh, a dangerous stimulus is encountered. And that's why we can use rats to understand what goes on in the human brain, not because rats and people are afraid of the same thing, but because their brains respond in a very similar way. Now, and the amygdala is, is usually thought of as, as the place where that uh, kind of connection is made. Now we've learned a lot about how this sort of learning takes place at the behavioral level, all sorts of details about you know, what the parameters of conditioning are and what produces the best conditioning. Like I said, you only have to condition the animal with one tone and shock uh, to create a, a sort of lifelong uh, memory of that, uh, that experience. Um, but there are various things that you can do to weaken that and so forth. Um, but, but all the details have been uncovered through you know, these many, many years of research going back to the 1920s and 30s where this, this kind of uh, 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 research first began. But we all, in the uh, last several decades, we've uncovered a tremendous amount about the neural circuitry that's involved in this kind of learning. Um, the information from the outside world comes into the lateral nucleus of the amygdala. It's distributed uh, within the amygdala to the central nucleus. And then the central nucleus controls responses like freezing behavior, autonomic nervous system responses like blood pressure and heart rate, uh, and stress hormone release and so forth. But not only do we know the sort of structural detail about how this works, inside the neurons we know many of the molecular mechanisms that allow that learning to take place. So when the tone and the shock come together and they meet up here in the lateral nucleus of the amygdala where that red spot is, that's a neuron that's receiving those two inputs. Uh, there are a variety of molecular changes that take place between those input uh, uh, connections and the postsynaptic cells. And these molecules basically kind of glue the connections into place so that the tone can now elicit a strong response in the amygdala, uh, whereas it couldn't do that before the learning. But I'm not going to talk too much about these details today. Uh, what I want to talk about more is conceptually uh, what's wrong with this idea that the um, um, amygdala is this, this source of fear in our brains? Well, um, this is a study, a very interesting and uh, important study uh, that was published in 2013. I have no problems with the data, but I do have a problem with the way the data were interpreted. Uh, what the study the title of the study, Fear and Panic in Humans with Bilateral Amygdala Damage. Now, many people were surprised that a person with uh, amygdala damage could still experience fear. But the only reason you'd be surprised at that is if that you believe that the amygdala is where fear is made in the brain. Um, so, Nature Science, Wired, Scientific American discovered many of the top magazines and, and journals, 
uh, in the field have these dramatic headlines. Human can feel terror even if they lack brain's fear center. Scaring the fearless, evoking fear in the fearless. Researchers scare fearless patient. What scared the fearless woman? Um, but as I said, the only reason you'd, you'd be surprised about this is if you thought the amygdala is what made, makes fear. Long ago, uh, Francis Bacon had uh, sort of warned scientists that they should be vigilant when using common language terms, fear being a common language term, uh, when, when we use these terms in science. And especially that we need to guard against tacitly giving reality to terms simply because we have a, a word for it, or giving uh, reality to things simply because we have a word for those things. So just because something has a name doesn't mean it's real. So everyone knows what uh, leprechaun, unicorn, vampire uh, means, but uh, very few people believe that these things actually exist. But you can imagine, and you, you know, as soon as I say the word unicorn, you imagine a kind of horse-like thing with a, a single horn coming out of it. So we all have this sense that these things are real, and the same is true of these common language words like fear, and uh, anger, and um, uh, sadness, and anxiety, all of these words that we use to talk about our emotions imply that we have this kind of um, emotion center in our brain that makes us feel those things. And I think that that's uh, um, a misconception that we need to straighten out. So when we reify fear in this way, uh, according to the psychologist uh, uh, Lisa Feldman, we're what we're doing is treating it as a natural kind, something that is believed to uh, be wired into the brain by evolution and to exist naturally in nature. This belief then justifies a search in the brain for that thing called fear. Uh, feelings about how the brain, sorry, findings about how the brain uh, detects and responds to threats are then used to conclude where fear lives in the brain, uh, since it is assumed that the same system that controls the responses gives rise to the feelings. Uh, this is an assumption that's shared by all sorts of different views and theories about emotion. So the idea, the common sense idea is that there's a stimulus, it activates the amygdala and the fear response occurs because fear is what the amygdala does. So the amygdala makes fear, fear response is controlled by the amygdala, tells us when fear, uh, when, when one is feeling fear, uh, and fear is what the amygdala does. So we can According to this idea, we can measure fear responses in a rat or a person, and if those responses are present, that means the person's feeling fear. So, a couple of key points. Threats can activate the amygdala in a person without the person being aware of the stimulus and without any conscious feeling of the fear. People can respond to threats without even being aware that the stimulus is uh, present. No conscious feeling at all is, is occurring either. So the amygdala detects and responds to threats. It doesn't feel fear, not even in humans. So and if we don't need to call upon fear to explain fear responses in people, why would we want to call upon fear to explain these responses in animals? Things are not much better when we talk about the topic of anxiety, a 2014 study showing that uh, a human anti-anxiety drug, uh, when given to crayfish, made them less inhibited about visiting a dangerous place. New York Times, anxious crayfish can be treated like humans. BBC, crayfish may experience a form of anxiety. So again, we're reifying these things. We're saying, okay, you've got some behavioral measure. That means that the animal is experiencing that state, and therefore we can use that behavioral measure to find that state in the animal. So, the crayfish is anxious because it's in this unusual, strange place. Um, all the study shows is that the drug changed behavior. And we have to be careful when we talk about um, fearful or anxious behavior, uh, meaning fearful or anxious feelings. And I think what we have to do is stop using terms like fear and anxiety when we're talking about behavior. We need to find a different way of talking about it. And that's what this paper, Coming to Terms with Fear, is all about. So basically what we're doing when we do this is we label non-conscious processes like threat detection with words about conscious feelings like fear. Then the conscious state, the fear, takes on the characteristics of the non-conscious processes. So the feeling of fear becomes responsible for the defense responses elicited by threats. And at the same time, the non-conscious processes take on properties of the conscious feeling. 
So the process of detecting and responding threat to threats comes to be the function of fear or anxiety. Once this happens, it becomes very difficult to disentangle these concepts because everyone is talking about fear uh, on the basis of responses. Responses are used to then tell us where fear is in the brain. It, it just, and that's the situation we're in now. It's all very complicated and uh, conflated. Things uh, are talked about in a way that makes it very hard to understand what a scientist means. Um, I'm often introduced in lectures, uh, especially to the lay public, as someone who's discovered how the brain feels fear. And that is absolutely not the case. In 1984, before I ever did any research on fear, uh, I proposed that this is how the system might work. I, was, I had it uh, in 1984, it was in a more general kind of framework, but the basic idea was this, that you have some emotional stimulus, say a danger stimulus that's outside in the world, and as it goes into the brain, it passes through systems that are, are involved in non-conscious processing that detect the threat organize the defense responses, these so-called fear responses, uh, but the, the stimulus also goes to cortical areas where we cognitively construct uh, what it is that, that's going on, and as part of that cognitive construction involving information coming from the responses itself, body feedback and so forth, uh, long-term memories about um, uh, other situations you've been in when there's been something dangerous, the kinds of feelings you remember through long-term memory uh, that are associated with danger and so forth. All of that is matched together in long-term memory to give uh, rise to that feeling of fear that you actually experience. I mean, fear is something you learn to associate a word with as a child. So your parents say, oh, you must have been so afraid when that dog was chasing you. And so you can match up the way you felt with the way your parents were talking to you and come to know what it feels like to, to, to feel fear. So we develop these templates and we use those templates uh, or schema to match current situations uh, to internal processes within the brain and to label that as a, a state like fear. So the two key ideas introduced in the Neuron paper that I mentioned that was published in 2012 is that of a survival circuit. Uh, and in this case, a defensive survival circuit as opposed to a fear circuit. So defensive survival circuit doesn't use the F word, uh, doesn't get us into trouble in terms of implying something subjective is going on in the animal. There may be something subjective going on in the rat, but it's certainly not what a human would experience as fear because fear is such a culturally loaded word and part of our experience based on um, uh, a, a totally human experience. They may have some kind of rat version of fear, but there's no way for us to actually go into the rat brain and know what that uh, actually is. So defensive survival circuit is a circuit that detects danger and responds to danger non-consciously. No consciousness is needed for that. And then there's a central state that results from this uh, survival circuit activity called the defensive mode of state. And unlike most people who talk about these central states of emotions and motivations, um, I don't think that the central state is the cause of the, the response, of the defense response. I think the central state is a consequence of the survival circuit activation. So a traditional view would be the fear stimulus or danger stimulus activates the threat detector. Uh, that creates a defensive motive state and that controls the responses. But the view I have instead is that this defensive mode of state is a consequence of survival circuit activity that creates a state uh, that then becomes part of the experience, um, but it itself is a non-conscious state. It involves brain arousal, it involves body feedback and all sorts of things. And all of this information can contribute to the conscious experience of fear, but it doesn't have to. Only in an organism that has the cognitive wherewithal to be able to take all of that information, including body feedback, the fact that the brain is in a defensive motive state, long-term memories, these schemas that we've um, put into our brain through experience and so forth. When all of that is sort of interpreted together at the same time, we get the conscious feeling of fear. But again, only organisms who have the ability to do that.
Now, I can't say for sure which animals do and don't have this ability. We know that humans do, but uh, that's where I'll stop speculating because there's no way to go into the mind of another organism. So there's always been this tension between subjectively experienced conscious aspects uh, of emotion and the objective measures that scientists uh, use to study fear and other emotions. So the objective measures are freezing, blood pressure, and so forth, uh, and the subjective experience is fear. So the problems become, as I've said, when we start using these responses to tell us that the person or animal is experiencing fear, when all we know is that the person or animal has detected danger and is responding to danger. Uh, the esteemed developmental psychologist at Harvard, Jerome Kagan, has a nice quote. He says, neuroscientists use fear to explain the empirical relation between two events. For example, rats freeze when they see a light previously associated with electric shock. Psychiatrists, psychologists, and most citizens, on the other hand, use fear to name a conscious experience of those who dislike driving over high bridges or encountering large spiders. These two uses suggest several fear states, each with its own genetics, incentives, physiological patterns, behavioral profiles, and so on. So I would modify, the, I would, I would modify Kagan's comment to say that they're not several fear states that only one of those is a fear state. The other is a defensive state, a defensive motivational state. Um, and the um, father of uh, ethology, Nico Tinbergen, had a similar point. Hunger, like anger, fear, and so forth, is a phenomenon that can be known only by introspection. When applied to another species, it is merely a guess about the possible nature of the animal's subjective states. Now, introspection tells us um, um, oh, the, the problem one here. Humans research, uh, on emo human research on emotions is necessarily based on our personal introspections. So as a scientist, we use introspection uh, to tell us what we're interested in. I mean, all scientists pursue things because they interest them. And in the case of being a psychologist interested in emotion, you have to uh, come to the, the sense that you're interested in emotion for some reason, and it's because you have emotions. You feel these emotions, you experience them. So that's what led me into this topic. So my introspections tell me that uh, uh, things like fear and love and so forth are interesting topics. Um, but then I quickly, quickly realized that the, that's not what I was studying. I was studying how the brain detects and responds to danger, not how it feels fear. But we start with these introspections, and we use terms like emotion and feeling. We're kind of using those interchangeably. So we have words for fear, anger, love, jealousy, and so forth. And we use these feeling state words as guideposts to go looking for emotion in the brain. So we search for all these emotions in the brain. These are all human words related to uh, subjective experience. Um, now. Over the years, researchers have questioned this approach. Uh, the wisdom of using feeling words uh, based on in introspection as a means of studying human emotion has been questioned by many, many different uh, authors. Regardless of the problems that arise when we're dealing with um, um, human emotions this way, they're greatly compounded when we're talking about animals. So when we start looking for fear, joy, anger, love, disgust, sadness, surprise, and so forth in animals, we're on very risky business, um, ris risky terrain there, because we can't go into another animal's head and know exactly what's going on. What we're asking is to treat animals like humans. We're saying, OK, let's, um, let's treat the rat like a little human that has all of our emotions and see if we can find those emotions in the rat brain. On the other hand, the, what we could do instead, and I think this is the way we should be doing it, is not treating animals like people but treat people like animals, which we are. So we should be asking what's similar about the rat brain and the human brain, and how does that similarity in the human brain allow us to have the emotions we have? That doesn't mean that the, that similar thing in the, in the rat brain and the human brain makes the rat feel fear, because as we've seen, the feeling of fear is something addition that's added to these defensive motivational states. So we're all anthropomorphic. Uh, it's natural and may be, it may be a kind of innate feature of our species. Uh, may, may be related to uh, our capacity for empathy. Um, 
And we assume that if an animal responds the, in a way that resembles the way a human responds when in danger, and the human feels fear, then the, the animal must feel fear. But just because it's natural doesn't mean it's scientifically correct. We have to wear two different hats when being a scientist and a layperson. Um, you know, I go home every day, I pet my cat Petey, he purrs, I think he's happy. But I'm not being a scientist at that point. Um, and if I allow myself this kind of uh, luxury in, in dealing with the science, all I do is confuse the literature, and that's where we are right now. You know, as Bacon warned, we have to be careful when using common language uh, terms in science. When we reify the reference of these words, it gives them a reality that it doesn't necessarily warrant. And uh, Lisa Barrett and James Russell and others have argued against uh, uh, this kind of use of, um, of uh, the reification of, of, um, for, on the basis of words, making emotions natural kinds in the brain that, that don't necessarily exist. So rats and cats may experience something, uh, but they probably have little to do with what we call things like fear or joy. For example, the rat is, uh, oh shit, he's going to eat me, and the cat, oh, that looks good, uh, grass-fed, uh, free-range mouse. So the rat is uh, feeling fear, and the, the cat is feeling joy. But we don't know what they're feeling. Oops, I'm going to back that up. Okay. We don't know what's going on inside their head. All we know is what we can measure as a scientist. We can measure their behavior, and we can interpret that behavior on the basis of non-conscious processes. Because, as I said earlier, even in the human brain, the ability to detect and respond to danger this way does not require that you feel fear. It's an innate response. So the brain does have innate mechanisms for detecting and responding to danger, but I maintain it doesn't have an innate fear system. Fear is individually, cognitively constructed on the basis of uh, past experience and social interactions and so forth. So, as I've said, we've learned a lot about how all this works in the brain, um, but I want to um, uh, come to terms with what we've been calling fear conditioning here. So, we call this a conditioned fear stimulus. We call these conditioned fear responses. We say that the amygdala is the seat of the fear system. I think that's bad terminology. Uh, we shouldn't be using it. We should be saying something like a threat stimulus elicits defense responses and this is a threat defense circuit, not a fear circuit. And the amygdala doesn't feel fear, it detects danger and responds to danger. It's a defensive survival circuit. Why does it matter? <clears throat> what, you know, is, is this just sort of a, a pet peeve? Does it make, does it mount to a hill of beans at all? Well, research on fear and anxiety in animals is being used to help understand what's changed in the brains of people with problems who, uh, in regulating their fear and anxiety, and also how to treat these problems. Findings about circuits that detect and respond to threats in animals are being talked about as if they explain how conscious feelings of fear of, and anxiety arise in people. Symptoms of fear and anxiety based on conscious and non-conscious processes may well be vulnerable to different predisposing factors and may also require different kinds of treatments. So we need to keep these things separate. Expressions like the fear system blur the distinction between these non-conscious processes and conscious processes. Adopting language that respects this distinction would help clarify the implications of research on animals for understanding how normal and pathological feelings of fear come about in the human brain. So here's an example of, of why we don't need to talk about emotion and feelings and all of that in this so-called area of fear conditioning or what I'm now calling threat conditioning. We can use new techniques called uh, optogenetics. Uh, Carl Dyseroff is the, the master of this and we collaborated with him on this project. To um, um, create learning in the rat, we can create so-called fear conditioning in the rat without any external unconditioned stimulus. So there's no shock, nothing like that. All we're going to do is give the rat a tone, which we would normally pair with the shock. But instead of pairing it with the shock, we're going to activate a, a small number of cells in the amygdala, which is what the shock would do from the outside. And so this is just a proof of principle here. But every time one of these little blue lines shows up here, it's a, a pulse of activity that is, a, a, sorry, 
um, a flash of laser light um, delivered directly into the lateral amygdala. And the reason that's important is because we've injected a virus into the lateral amygdala that has a special light sensitive molecule attached to it called channel rhodopsin, that's the CHR2. And that uh, uh, molecule has the ability to open the cell membrane and uh, allow ions to flow and generate action potentials. So you can see every time we flash the, uh, the light through a fiber optic cable implanted in the amygdala where all the virus is, you get these responses. So here's a, a one second um, period. Every 10 milliseconds we flash, and so every time we flash you get responses. Do it again, again you get responses. Each line, each row here is a, uh, another trial through this. So we can activate these amygdala neurons this way. And this is what the unconditioned stimulus, the shock, would do as well. It, would, it strongly activates these amygdala cells. Now, if we pair the tone with these amygdala cell activations, the rat will learn to freeze just as if it had received a shock. So you can see freezing here, uh, but not in these control guys. So there's no emotion involved. We're just turning on cells while they're getting inputs. As far as this amygdala cell knows, it's just been activated because its membrane has uh, been opened up and the ions are flowing in. And it also has glutamate coming in from a, a neuron that's right next to it. That's all that's happening in terms of that cell. And yet that's enough to activate the system in a way to actually produce this kind of so-called fear behavior, this defense response. Um, and we can show that, that it works like the shock because we can use a very weak shock, which itself produces no conditioning. Combine that with weak optical stimulation, which itself produces no conditioning or weak conditioning. And the two will sum together. So here's the, here's the control. Here's the weak conditioning alone, the, the shock itself. Uh, so tone and shock. But if we combine that with weak optical depolarization, we get a much stronger response. So the two U.S. is the natural shock U.S. and the artificial U.S. caused by depolarization in the brain produce the exact same thing. So no need to call upon fear. All we have to talk about is how two stimuli from the outside world activate pathways that release neurotransmitter in the amygdala onto a common cell. And as a result of the, the strong stimulus, the U.S., uh, changing the biochemistry of that cell, the learning takes place. We can boost it in a, uh, by adding norepinephrine. So you might say, well, that's emotional learning when norepinephrine is released, because it, it is in the, in the real world. But it's not the emotion that does that. The shock is causing the norepinephrine to really be released. Uh, we can artificially release the norepinephrine and just squirt it onto the amygdala. And when we do that, this CSUS response produced artificially uh, produce, it gets bigger. So all of this is very mechanical in nature. It doesn't require the animal feel anything. doesn't require the animal have any external experience. Just a tone coming in, releasing glutamate. Uh, a depolarization of the amygdala cells, squirting a little bit of norepinephrine, and you then simulate kind of a full-blown emotional response without any emotion at all. So it's not about emotion. Emotion is something that happens in a brain that can be conscious of its own activities. This is synaptic plasticity. We don't need to talk about psychology at all for the learning to take place. Now, uh, I've already mentioned this, but let me go through it again. So um, humans can be conditioned without knowing the stimulus is present and uh, without feeling anything. So people with brain damage, for example, damage to the hippocampus disrupts the ability to um, uh, remember being conditioned, but you still condition. So you present the, uh, the tone in shock, and they still respond to the tone uh, with the uh, galvanic skin response. Um, amygdala damaged people have the opposite problem. They don't condition, but they, they now remember being conditioned. Hippocampal people don't remember condi being conditioned, but they have the conditioned response. So it's a matter of whether you consciously remember the experience or whether you express the implicit, non-conscious stimulus response uh, 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 connection there. Subliminal con conditioning uh, in people, you can present stimuli in certain ways using certain tricks that causes the uh, conscious awareness of the stimulus to be prevented. Um, you can condition the person either while they, uh, uh, with these subliminal stimuli or you can condition them with full sight. Uh, 
and then present the stimulus implicitly. Either case, you can produce responses without the person uh, being aware that the stimulus is present and without uh, feeling anything. It's also a condition called blind sight, where people are blind for one side of space. Uh, if you present a stimulus that the person's been conditioned to separately in that part of space, uh, they can respond to it even though they deny seeing it. So you don't need conscious awareness of the stimulus and you don't need a feeling to produce this kind of conditioning. Human subjective experience is not the best starting point uh, for phenomena re relevant to emotion uh, that are shared by humans and other animals. So how should we proceed uh, in studies of animals if, uh, if not on the basis of these introspections? I think what we have to do is separate the phenomena of interest from the overarching concept of emotion. So what are the key phenomena? Responses that occur when uh, an organism faces challenges or opportunities. Situations in which survival or well-being is potentially compromised or enhanced. So challenges and opportunities, that's the key thing. So here's some examples of challenges. You got a predator is present, chance to escape. Low energy supplies, chance to get food. Uh, fluid imbalance, a chance to drink, and so forth. Now, so rather than talking about emotions in rats and people, starting from the, you know, the slide I had earlier, where it fear and love and all those emotions coming down, what we can do is come at this problem from the bottom up. So we can look for survival functions that are hardwired in the brains of, of animals and also in people, including defensive survival functions, energy nutrition management functions, fluid balance, thermoregulation, reproduction. These are the, the systems that if you were studying emotion and motivation in animals, these are the systems you would be studying and yet you would be talking about it in terms of subjective experiences of hunger and fear and all of that. That's, I think, what we need to avoid. What, we're, what we want to do is reduce this down to uh, operational terms in terms of specific bodily functions. Now, these, the systems that control these, these uh, functions are very highly conserved. So this is the energy and nutritional system uh, all of the hormones involved in, in rats and mice and other uh, mammals are very similar to what goes on in uh, the human brain in terms of regulating our energy and, and nutritional resources. Uh, sex hormones, reproductive hormones, very similar. We have all the same hormones in the human brain and, and, and the brains of other animals. Um, now, we have to be careful about one thing is we're not talking about conserved behaviors. You know, the temptation is that what evolution has done is conserve behaviors. No, evolution has conserved uh, circuits. The behavior that is involved uh, can vary widely. So here's an example. In order for a female rat to get pregnant, she has to adopt this lordosis posture where her back is swayed. Otherwise, the, uh, the male rat can't penetrate properly for the semen to make it into the reproductive tract and fertilize the egg. Um, so she can only do this at the uh, a certain point in her cycle um, uh, when she's fertile. Any other time, it just won't happen. Um, so that's a very species-specific kind of behavior, but it's the same kind of basic circuitry and um, uh, hormonal uh, functions that are present in, in human brains as well uh, and other primates. But primates don't have to have this kind of behavioral uh, stereotype response. Uh, and people do it all kinds of ways. So it's not about the behavior, it's about the conserved circuit. Uh, that's the point I want to make. Now, survival phenomena are closely associated with emotion, and behavioral tests of emotion use these to assess emotion. But these things would be of interest if we never had the terms emotions and feelings. They're important to understand, um, uh, they're important for understanding emotions, but are not emotional phenomena. The conceptual linkage of emotion with basic mechanisms that underlie behavioral interactions with the environment and faced with challenges and opportunities has hijacked our understanding of the function of these mechanisms and behaviors. So here's a proposal. Behavioral responses associated with, de with defense, reproduction, energy, thermoregulation, fluid balance can be expressed in species-specific ways. The function, defense, reproduction, etc., is conserved, but the behavior can vary. The function is conserved by the conservation of circuits. 
Uh, and behavior can be used to assess or access when a survival circuit is active, but should not be used as a proxy for feelings. Survival responses can be triggered without awareness of the stimulus and without any feeling. All animals have to solve these problems, detect and respond to threats, detect and respond to nutrients and energy sources, balance fluids and electrolytes, thermoregulate and reproduce. Not just animals like us, but even bacterial cells. So here's some bacterial cells living in a petri dish. Uh, this is a black and white picture of it. Uh, the researchers poured acid into the petri dish and the bacterial cells all move away. They have these flagella and they use them to wiggle away from the harmful chemicals and to wiggle towards uh, useful chemicals. Swimming pool, pour acid in, people all move away. So my animation uh, slowed down there. Um, obviously there's a l big difference between bacteria and people, um, but there are also some important similarities. You know, bacteria are single cells, but in the course of evolution, first we have multicellular colonies and then uh, multi-system, multicellular, multi-system organisms, of which humans are one example. All animals are multicellular, multi-system uh, organisms. Uh, that's, we belong to this group called metazoa. And um, so this is a family tree here, plants going up there, fungi, so forth all starting with the Monera. Um, so we have all these systems, and the way all these systems get coordinated in us to promote our survival is by way of the nervous system. So the nervous system's job is to take all of these complex systems made up of different kinds of cells uh, that perform different functions and coordinate it and keep us organized as a fully functioning organism. Now, the vertebrate brain is very similarly organized in all vertebrate animals. So whether you're a fish, a frog, a, a, a snake, or an alligator, or a monkey, dog, cat, rat, human, you have a hindbrain, midbrain, and forebrain. And when, within each of these three major divisions, there are very similar circuits uh, that are in there. So uh, we have this cons conserve, highly conserved circuitry across all vertebrates. Invertebrates are a completely different matter. Uh, there are many different kinds of nervous systems and different kinds of invertebrates, so there's no particular kind of uh, system. And we didn't evolve from anything that would look like uh, something with a brain like this, where there's a ganglion cell here that coordinates things. The, the, the vertebrate brain actually comes more from a, a creature like this. And a long line of, of uh, evolution all has to do with the um, um, direction of, of uh, body part uh, development during early life. So there's this conservation across vertebrates and invertebrates, but not at the level of neural organization. The circuits are different, but many of the molecules uh, involved in these functions like defense, learning, feeding, and so forth, reproduction, are very highly conserved. Uh, and some, uh, some of these molecular uh, constituents are conserved across plants and animals as well. For example, plants have NMDA receptors and serotonin transporter genes. It's actually work now on um, uh, the role of SSRIs in depression using data from um, the, the uh, serotonin receptor uh, function in plants. So there's this highly, we're, we're highly connected with all forms of life that have ever existed on Earth. Um, this is just an example of the similarities of um, the molecular constituents of learning in mammals, and animals like rats and mice and us, with invertebrates like an, uh, the aplesia. This is work from, this is put together by David Glansman, Eric Kandel's Nobel Prize winning work on, uh, uh, on learning in the aplesia. So it's all these molecules, same molecules are involved in, in mammals. So there's a highly conserved molecular basis for learning uh, and, and all other functions in, in, the, uh, in the brain. But it goes much deeper than that because uh, this is the work of uh, Seth Grant. And what Seth shows is that, for example, if we focus on the NMDA receptor, which is very important for synaptic plasticity and learning in, in um, uh, mammals and other vertebrates, uh, these receptors are also present 
in, not only in, in mice, but also in flies. But what gets really interesting is that constituents of these receptors go all the way back in evolution to single cell organisms and even to different branches uh, altogether to fungi and so forth. So there are, evolution is, has, the, has parts of the NMDA receptor in single cell organisms. So you don't need the NMDA receptor until you have two cells because the receptor is a way that a chemical release from one cell uh, can be used by another cell. But the nervous, or the, the cell, has these constituents that then become used to make the NMDA receptor and to be used in signaling across the cell membrane um, um, because it existed in some other form in an earlier form of life. So the point is that the basic building blocks uh, of elemental functions of the nervous system are as old as life itself. Um, the survival functions of all organisms, whether we're talking about people, rats, cats, dogs, fish, aplesia, worms, cockroaches, bacterial cells, the basic survival functions are the same. Uh, defending against danger, managing nutrition and energy, uh, fluid balance and, and electrolyte balance, thermoregulation, reproduction. Those things may be done and are done in very different ways in different organisms, uh, but the functions they achieve uh, for the organism are very same, very similar. Now, when you put those functions into a nervous system that can be conscious of its own activities, what you get is a feeling. And again, we don't know which other animals had these feelings, but we know that humans have them. And we know that the machinery that makes human feelings involves some of the highest levels of the neocortex that are poorly developed in many other mammals uh, and uh, may, maybe even some of them non-existent in other mammals, uh, and much more developed in humans even than in, in other primates. So we have to be careful, given this um, relationship between the mechanisms of consciousness in the human brain and these highly evolved, more recent uh, components of the human neocortex, uh, we, we shouldn't be speculating that other animals that lack these constituents have these kinds of conscious experiences. So that's my bottom line message, and uh, I hope you enjoyed the lecture, and have a good conference. Thank you.